Yes. Um, Mr Bishop, I'm going to ask you to look now at a memo you sent in July of 1986. It's ARMO 40548. Uh, we can see the date from the top of the page, 4th of July. It's from you to, I think, the members of your field force, your sales team. Um, uh, in the first paragraph, you say, I enclose for your information a copy of an article from Cutter Laboratories um, from The Lancet, virtually a repeat of a letter from the same company in The Lancet in May. Both these articles, besides attempting to clarify their own heat treating procedure, identify ours as being implicated in the cases quoted. The decision has been taken to respond to the Lancet within two to three weeks with a carefully prepared defence statement setting the facts straight. As soon as this document is prepared, copies will be forwarded to you together with a technical bulletin. However, in the meantime, this subject is sure to be raised again. And in order that you're well prepared, I enclose, besides copies of the recent Lancet letters, further copies of Robert Christie's technical bulletin and paper relating to the Dutch case, the Lancet article of March 15th relating to the Chapel Hill case, and also the technical bulletin and paper prepared by Robert Christie of the 25th of March on the McDougall article. Um, you then refer to um, a McDougall paper. You say the letter's very misleading. I'm not going to go through the detail of that. Um, and then, bottom of the page, you say the defence document referred to above will be based on the following information, which please feel free to discuss openly with any of your contacts, but under no circumstances let copies be made. And if we go over the page, we'll see you say this. So this uh, th thus far, I'm mean, right in understanding that what now follows is information you're suggesting your sales team use it, when questions, or if and when questions are raised with them about Armour's product. Yes. Okay. So you say the suggested implication of Armour heat-treated factor eight and HTLV3 antibody zero conversion is based on two cases both of which received prior treatment with non-heat-treated products. And then you refer to the, um, the Dutch case. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through the detail of it. That's case one. Case two you refer to um, is, um, I think, a US case, the Chapel Hill case, and you refer there to a Lancet article. Um, and then you say the defense against factor H should take into consideration the following factors, and then you refer to various studies, and then if we go over the page, you then refer to various personal communications, so said to be a personal communication from Dr. Anna Pettigrew in Glasgow, uh, a personal communication from Smitzer Binger in Groningen, um, uh, from uh, what's said to be Mags, University College London, that I think is probably Dr. Bolton Mags, Dr. Kernoff, um, and then uh, Amsterdam. And then you list a number of centres and you say, no reports from the above, almost exclusively on Armour or other UK centres of zero negative conversions since UK introduction of HT product in November slash December 1984. Now, um, what's missing from this, Mr. Bishop, is any reference to Dr. Whitmore's case in Lewisham. Why was that? Um, I don't know. Okay. The, the, I don't know. The one case that you know had been reported, you're not telling your oh, sales whether, team about. Oh, wh whether, whether that was because it was still under review, I don't know. Um, I think in fairness, um, Mr Bishop, I should probably show you what you said about this issue um, when you gave your deposition in 1990 um, in the proceedings okay. in um, Pennsylvania. So it's CGRA 40521, please, Shomik. Um, and we'll see top of the page in the Court of Common Pleas of Philadelphia County, Pennsylvania. And then if we go further down the page, Oral deposition of Christopher Roy Bishop, held at Richards Butler's Solicitors, London, 6th of June, 1990. Now, what we have, Mr Bishop, is, is a very incomplete record. So we only have some pages, not, or, not all, or indeed most of the, um, the deposition. Um, 
But if we go to um, page, it's probably page 12, electronic ischemic. Um, you'll see, and it, it's, not, it's not entirely easy to follow this document, Mr. Bishop, as, as, as you may recall if you've reread it, because there's lots of objections from the American lawyers involved to the, to the questions. But you were being asked, and if we pick it up at line 15 and 16, you're being asked in the July document, which may be a reference to the document we were just looking at, why you hadn't mentioned Dr. Whitmore's patient. And the bottom of the page, you give an answer. Um, you say, the reason it did not appear in that is, I repeat my earlier statements, referring to Mr. Christie's memo again, or these two memos in there now, which refer to the confidential nature of that information, and again referring to my previous statement where I said that unless material is cleared by the Clinical and Technical Affairs Department, it would not appear in a sales and marketing uh, document. And then if we look down the same page to line 18 onwards, Question, in that context, what about, again, Dr. Whitmore's patient's answer? Well, we weren't authorised to make reference to Dr. Whitmore's patient, and who withheld authorisation? Precisely who, I do not know, but it would have been... We would not have had permission from that department to include that report in the sales and marketing document. Um, and then, over the page, we pick it up at line 13... You're asked by Mr. Schrager, to what department do you refer with held authorization? Answer, Clinical and Medical Technical Affairs Department of Revlon UK. Is it your best recollection now that we've reviewed this that you took up with them the subject of Dr. Whitmore's patients and they told you not to refer to them? Answer, I can't recall specifically taking up the case of Dr. Whitmore. Um, and then bottom of the page, you're asked, is it your best recollection that that department did withhold authorization? Go to the next page. Questions repeated, lines three to four. Your answer at line five, yes, because thinking back, I do recall a specific request from Dr. Whitmore that this information should be deemed highly confidential, and, and you'll give a little more information about that. Line 12, so that benchmark for whether or not you were to report was whether you had permission from the clinician. Answer. The benchmark for the medical and technical affairs department, whether to act upon that would have been from the clinician. My benchmark would have been the permission from the clinical and technical medical affairs department. Um, uh, a question, Revlon Wright, answer, yes. <coughs> now, I don't know whether... Um, actually, sorry, just to complete it, over the page... So that we don't need to look back at this document, Mr Bishop. Line 11... New question, as of July 1986, as the Director of Marketing, were you seriously concerned about the adverse impact on your sales of haemophiliac by discussion in the literature of alleged zero conversions in association with the product? Answer, I was concerned at the interpretation being placed by competition, especially on those reports. So just wanted to show you that, Mr Bishop, out of fairness, because I'm asking you about events a long time ago. You appear to be saying in this deposition that you didn't include reference to Dr. Whitmore's patient because you didn't have permission from your regulatory affairs department to do so. Oh, it's the same. Well, it's, 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 um, it's the same as the US de de deposition, isn't it? I didn't have permission. I didn't have the uh, clear clearance from uh, my medical department. So, at the same time as uh, I said. Uh, in the uh, US uh, deposition. So if, if we just go back to ARMO 40548, page 3. Do we understand then, looking at this list of communications, that you did have express permission from your regulatory affairs department to record... Um, what Dr. Pettigrew, Dr. Pettigrew, Smitsabinger, Dr. Bolton Mags, Dr. Kernoff, and the, all the various centres listed there were telling you. 
but you didn't have permission yes. to include reference to the one patient believed to have zero converted in the UK. Oh, that would appear to be the case. Why was permission from your regulatory affairs department required for you to tell your own sales team, your own armour employees, that there was indeed a case in the UK of zero conversion on heat treated factor eight? Why was what, sir? Why was permission required from the regulatory affairs department for you to tell your well, own staff about this case? Uh, I, I'm not sure that's... Um... Because, that's because that's where I took my instructions from, regarding um, talking on, uh, talking on uh, regulatory and uh, um, uh, medical matters. Uh, I, I think there may be a prior question, which is whether he did tell his own staff, because this document uh, is designed, as I understand it, for his sales force to tell others. So this is a question of what they should tell doctors, not what they should themselves be told. I'll ask that logically prior question, so you're quite right. Did you tell your own staff about the Lewisham case? I don't recall. Did you... Probably, probably not. Probably not. Did you say to whoever it was you were dealing with in the Regulatory Affairs Department... I'm very uncomfortable about the sales line I'm telling my staff to take because we are concealing the one positive case we know about. Um, no, no, it wasn't. No, no, it wasn't my place to question what they were, what they were saying. Were you uncomfortable about the fact that this one positive case was not being referred to? Oh, no, I don't, I don't recall, but I don't recall um, one way or the, or the other. Um, I'm sure if I had, if I, if I had some concerns, there would have been some uh, official uh, document somewhere in the volumes um, expressing uh, that, that displeasure or unease to, uh, to uh, officially to the, to the medical department. And, and so it's right, isn't it, to read this, this document, which is the chair rightly points out, is what you were telling your staff to tell clinicians. Um, it, would you accept it's giving clinicians an incomplete picture? It's missing one cru crucial piece of information, isn't it? No, not at all. Why is it relevant for that, clinicians? That, 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 the details of those, ca of those cases uh, were, were not, as far as I remember, were, were not finalised, and uh, the confidentiality of a clinician um, should be respected. So I had no qualms about not, uh, not including them, notwithstanding the fact that the medical department didn't, didn't clear it. Now, we saw from the first page of this letter that you were advocating a defence statement, essentially defending Armour's product, defending its viral inactivation process. Um, mm. If we look next at CGRA 40527, this is from you to Dr. Harris, 16th of July, 1986. Um, says, in light of the US refusal to originate a defence document as discussed, I propose the following to form a basis for a UK originated document. Now, just pausing there, do you know why the US was refusing to do the defence document that you'd asked for? No, I don't. And then we see objective to nullify negative impact of the published zero conversion stories to restore slash confirm confidence in our heat treating process regarding HIV and activation three, to demonstrate our faith in our own product. Those objectives are yep. all about Armour keeping hold of its market share, are they not? They don't relate to patient safety at all. That, that that by, by our people <clears throat> would be would be implicit 
and understood. Okay. Uh, and then suggested format. Um, I don't think we need to go through the details of that, but you suggest some points that should be made, and then you conclude, I would emphasise that this document is essential for the maintenance of factor eight business in our markets. Um, yep. if, if we then turn to um, a memo you sent a couple of days later to your sales force, ARMO 40562, Um, so this is another house message, 18th of July, from you to the sales team. Factor 8 recall media response. As discussed with you individually, I enclose copies of the New Scientist and Guardian articles of the 17th of July on the above-mentioned subject. You say in the next paragraph that they were, uh, you've been told they were initiated by the actions of Dr. Peter Jones. Um, you then say in the next paragraph, it may well be, and it's to be hoped that the majority of doctors will view the articles in the light of this objective, the objective being to, you say, for Dr. Jones to justify what he'd said in Newcastle, and the contents immediately discredited. And then you set out a number of comments. So these are points, first of all, made by reference to the New Scientist article. Bottom of the page, you say this, the two Britons referred to have not been proven and are still undergoing tests and investigations, but there is yet no proof that they developed antibodies as a result of treatment with Armour's factor eight. Um, wh why were you seeking to emphasize that point, um, Mr. Bishop? Well, I think it's obvious to protect the, uh, to protect the, uh, uh, the good name of uh, the Armour product. Over the page, <clears throat> you assert um, that the Dutch patient was not, repeat, not a clean virgin patient. Um, then um, you say, by reference to a comment on the New Scientist article, paragraph two, the whole tone of this paragraph is an attempt to undermine Armour's objectives and integrity. Yes, we did want to keep the exchange low key in order not to cause adverse publicity and thus distress to the patient. We would emphasize that the recall was voluntary and agreed with the Department of Health. Um, in what sense would you say, or did you consider Armour had demonstrated integrity in the process that we've been looking at in relation to its heat-treated factor eight product? Well, by, by, <clears throat> by keeping them informed via the, um, by, by the sales force, the information came to the sales force. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I didn't we were, quite... We were keeping, we, we were keeping them uh, totally up, up to date and, and, and our position um, with regards to the um, uh, papers and uh, publicity that was being, uh, uh, being published. You, you can't have been <clears throat> keeping your own sales force completely up to date if you weren't telling them about Dr Whitmore's Lewisham patient, can you? Well, we already covered why we didn't... Uh, include the Whitmore patient. If we look at the third page of this document, again, I'm not going to go through your detailed comments on the New Scientist and Guardian articles. Um, you say this in the third paragraph, it's our feeling and that of our advisors who include members of the UK Haemophilia Centre fraternity, just pausing there, who were your advisors, your advisors who were members of the UK Haemophilia Centre fraternity? Um, that would be the, um, uh, uh, the committee of the Haemophilia Society, UK Haemophilia Society. <clears throat> so you're not there referring to any clinicians? Um, well, it could be, it could be a, yes, it could include um, any physicians that had, um, you know, made, made comment. I, I can't recall any specific... Um, I, I, cer I certainly recall um, discussions uh, uh, with, with some directors about uh, about the way you know the, the, uh, the, the publicity uh, was being uh, th these things were being covered by by the by the uh, not only the late press but by uh, um, uh, medical press. And then continuing with that paragraph. Um 
at our filling that of our advisors that these articles be treated with the contempt they deserve and therefore we propose to take no further action other than discussion by you with individual doctors who may express some concern which you're in a position to discuss on a sensible level. Uh, and then this, you say, unfortunately, the mention of Dr. Michael Riddell's statement that we are reviewing our hate treatment process now prevents us from preparing an official defence document slash article to the Lancet, which would not be totally misconstrued by those wishing to cast dispersions on the armour operation. We cannot, on the one hand, defend our existing treatment and then immediately introduce a new one, although the reasons for introducing the new process are primarily to attack the non-A, non-B problem. Um, it, it, it might be said that you're expressing a degree of frustration or um, that uh, ALMA was reviewing its heat treatment process. Is, is that right? Or wasn't that exactly what you'd been arguing for months previously? It, it was, yes. And that, that was to, you know, to counter the, uh, uh, the perception that uh, hotter for longer was... Uh, was better. Although we, we, we showed our, 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 you know, our treatment was uh, um, more than effective in um, uh, against HLV, HLV three. Um, do you now understand, Mr. Bishop, even if you didn't at the time, that Armour's viral and activation process was not effective in eradicating HTLV3? Or are you still maintaining the view that it was effective? As I understand it, I, um, it, 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 it was effective okay. against HTLV3, but not, not, not NA, non-A, B. Let, let's conclude the, 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 the saga in relation to uh, Heat treated factor eight by looking at ARMO four zeros five eight five. This is a memo of the twenty ninth of September nineteen eighty six from Mr. Christie. It's copied to you and to Dr. Harris, um, and it refers to a communication from Dr. Frank Hill at Birmingham Children's Hospital. Dr. Hill rang me this morning to report two haemophiliac children who had seroconverted to HIV antibody positive following a long course of armor heat treated factor VIII. Both children had received non heat treated factor VIII products, but not since 1984. Dr. Hill agreed that this incident should be reported to the DHSS. He also believed a publication describing his experience should be prepared. And then details are given of the cases and the batches of product. Um, if we go over the page, you'll see, um, Mr. Bishop, the list of batch numbers, and then they have either an asterisk or two asterisks beside them. If we go further down the page, just below that list, we can see the meaning of those um, asterisks. So. Um, a single asterisk is non-donor screened on recall list. A double asterisk is non-donor screened not on recall list. And then the, the, the final mark refers to donor screened product. If we just go back and look at the list at the top of the page, and I'm just taking this case by way of example. Um, it, it would appear from this that there had been some treatment of a child with the non-donor screened product that was not on the recall list. Can you help us understand why unscreened product had not been recalled and was still in use for the treatment of children? Um, <clears throat> no, no, no. Which, which are the non-screened? So the double asterisk is the non-donor screened, not on recall list. The single asterisk is non-donor screened, but on the recall list. Do, do you know, understand the difference between the, what batches uh, were recalled and what could, weren't? It, it, yeah, it could, it, could well, it could well have been that uh, they, um, uh, Frank Hill chose not to, uh, not to return the unscreened product um, because of Whatever, whatever reason, um, whether shortage of stock at the time or whether 
Um, I, I, I don't know. I can, I, can, I can only assume that's a decision by, uh, by the hospital, um, not by, not by Army. What was your reaction on learning that children at the Birmingham Children's Hospital had been infected with HIV following treatment with Armour's Factor 8 heat-treated product? Well, obviously uh, devastated. Did you continue to think that there was no problem with the product and that it should be proactively defended? Well, in September '86, well, we're, we're coming up to the uh, to the period then of uh, um, uh, discontinuation of the products, aren't we? Yes. Very shortly afterwards, it was withdrawn, and we'll come on to that shortly in a moment. But um, what was your own view in relation to whether the product should be withdrawn or should continue to be um, uh, supplied? What coming up to that period? Uh, on, once you learned on the 29th of September that there were these additional cases now involving children at the Birmingham Children's Hospital, can you recall what your thinking was about what should now be done? No, I can't. I'm sorry. Now, we know that there was a meeting with the DHSS on the 3rd of October, another on the 6th of October. You were not at those meetings, so I'm not going to ask you about them. Um, um, can I ask you to look, however, at a, a very short note of a meeting you were at... CGRA 40530. So this is headed Factor 8 General Recall, October 1986, Recall Committee Meeting, Tuesday 7th of October, 800 hours. London meeting... This was the, this was the day after the meeting with the DHSS, was it? It looks like that, yes. Yeah. Um, and it says London meeting, and then it's got a list of attendees, which include you, and then it says the asterisk yeah, well, personnel attended DHSS, so that didn't include you. So you uh, didn't go to the right. DHSS. We, we, we had to stay in the hotel. <laughs> um, uh, but there appears to be an account of the meeting. Um, it said that Jeffries, that's Dr. Jeffries, who was at the... Um, from the DHSS, cut across all armour arguments about new developments, etc., to require withdrawal. Um, PAH, that's Dr. Harris, summarised our case, including gaps in knowledge of serial conversions together with donor testing on the current product. From DHSS, heat treatment is invalidated. Armour has serial conversions and no one else has. Licence would be revoked if product not withdrawn. It's right, isn't it, that Armour was effectively given no choice now. It was told in terms by the department that the licence would be withdrawn. Yeah. Do you recall the discussions that, that took place that morning about what to do? Not, spe not specifically, no. Um, we know I'm not going those, to... Those action points were, were obviously uh, agreed. We know that on the 7th of October, there's a letter announcing the withdrawal of Factor 8. There's a press release. I'm not going to t take you to those. Um, do you know what was done with the product that was held in, in haemophilia centres um, at that point in time? Was it all returned to Eastbourne? And if so, what was then done with it? Um, um, it would obviously be re returned, but I, I, I don't know how it was disposed of. Do you know if it was sold elsewhere in other countries? No, it's, no, certainly not. No, it certainly would not have been. No. Was heat-treated factor eight withdrawn from other markets at this time or just in the United Kingdom? I believe it was just the United Kingdom. Did you have concerns about... I'm sorry, carry on. No, no. You, you had responsibility for a bigger geographical area, Netherlands... Scandinavia, uh, uh, Ireland, etc. Um, what consideration can you recall being given to withdrawing the product in any of those other countries? Well, the, pro the products were, um, were withdrawn, and that, and that was it. These markets were supplied from from the UK. Um, I'll ask you just now a number of 
rather more general questions, reflecting on, on the issues that I've been asking you about. Um, did the discovery from Dr. Hill that children had seroconverted on the armour product, and that there's reference in the documents, I won't take you to, to a third case coming to light very shortly afterwards, did that lead to any reflection within armour about how it had dealt with this whole issue of its viral inactivation process? I can't, I can't recall. After 30, 40 years. Um, was there ever that you can recall any attempt within armour to look back to see what had gone wrong, whether in relation to its heat-treated product or its unheat-treated product? I can't, I can't, uh, I can't be believe that we, we even thought we'd done anything wrong. We, we, on the contrary, we, um, as a company, we've done everything possible to provide the best possible treatment, the most up-to-date um, uh, systems um, in accordance with the state of art at that time. It's very easy to be a Monday morning quarterbacks or have the benefit of hindsight. You may have effectively answered my next handful of questions by that response, Mr Bishop, but I'm going to ask them anyway. Is there anything you think you or Armour should have done differently with regards to it, your non-heat-treated product? No. Anything you or Armour should have done differently in relation to the heat-treated product? Having regard to the documents that we've looked at today, do you accept that Armour should have withdrawn the heat-treated product earlier than October 1986? No, I do not accept that. Do you accept that Armour should have been more open and transparent with the information it was providing to clinicians about possible risks from its heat-treated product? No. I think we did. I think we did everything, everything we, we could um, uh, with the information uh, that we had available on, on, on any patient or or any disease or what have you. We, uh, at all times, um, you know, we did. I feel and I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that we we did do everything uh, in the right way. Were any lessons learnt by Alma from? What had happened? Not that I no, not no, no specific lessons because we, you know, um, again, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, lots of things could be done differently. Um, but we didn't, uh, you know, we didn't have the benefit of hindsight. It might be said, at least in relation to the 1985-1986 period that we've been looking at that Armour's overriding focus was concern about losing ground to the competition rather than ensuring the safety of patients treated with its product. Do you have any comment on that? Well, that, that, was my, that was my, as a marketing um, uh, person for which I was employed, that was my, that was a, a, a major concern, um, uh, commensal, uh, as, and, and secondary only to um, the safety factor. And the welfare of the, of the hemophiliac patient and his and his uh, and his family and um, his, the teams looking after him. Um, so those are the questions I had for Mr. Bishop. But um, we now obviously need to give an opportunity to uh, CPs through their recognised legal representatives to suggest any further questions that they would wish me to explore with Mr. Bishop. So. Although it means sitting rather later this evening, could we take a break now to give people a proper chance to suggest any further lines of questioning? Uh, yes, let me just uh, explain um, to you, Mr. Bishop. Um, all, all the questions you've been asked, uh, apart from the, the odd question by me, have been asked by uh, Ms. Richards, um, counsel to the inquiry. Uh, and she will ask the, the questions, unless it's unlikely that there is any particular application for anyone else to, to ask you one. But at this stage, 
it is usual for her to field questions. There are a lot of core participants who have different uh, approaches to the inquiry who are entitled to ask her to ask questions of you. And we must give them an opportunity to, to formulate those and, and uh, counsel to work out how she's going to, to put those points to you. So it'll take a little while. It always happens with every witness. I don't know if you've seen any of our proceedings before, but this is standard. Uh, and it does mean, I'm afraid, uh, that we're going to have to ask you to, uh, to stay on a, a bit. Um, we won't come back before quarter to five. Uh, I hope by then we may be ready. We may not. You'll be told if um, uh, there's a further delay. But um, uh, after that, just to give you an idea of, of timing, I would expect probably, but I can't say because I don't know how many questions there'll be, uh, that you should be uh, finished before half past five and probably a little bit before that. I hope that uh, helps with uh, your planning. That's fine, Sir Brian. Thank you. Well, we'll take a break then till quarter to five.